Wait, before you listen to this episode, I just had to tell you about our new free mini wealth building training. In this training, we're covering the first steps to building wealth, how to find your personalized wealth path, how to find and analyze deals, and then some. So don't miss out on this free training. I mean, what do you have to lose? It's free. Sign up at www.abundantculture.co slash newsletter. Don't let delay get in the way of your abundant year. Now, back to the episode. Welcome back to Abundant Culture Podcast. Where we dissect the mindsets and tactics of the true beast of business. People like Gary Vee, Grant Cardone, and Warren Buffett. All to create a blueprint to experience life more abundantly. Hi, Emily, and thank you again for coming on to the Abundant Culture Podcast. We are super excited to have you today because there is just so much synergy between us. And we've been talking about this uh, right before we started recording and when we were on the phone a couple of weeks ago. So uh, before we dive into all the business stuff and all that synergistic uh, energy, we have to ask you, what is your backstory? Like, how did you get into business? How'd you get to here? (laughs) Sure. So first of all, thank you guys thank you both so much for having me i'm really excited to be here and really excited to just be sharing my story hoping to um inspire some some folks today because truthfully when i was a little kid and even when i was growing up or imagining what was possible for me i certainly didn't expect this this conversation nor the position that i'm in right now to be a part of that conversation so um little background i grew up in the middle of indiana where i am currently still located i took a bit of a hiatus to travel the world because a part of my life's mission for the longest time that i can remember has been to be the change that i wish to see in the world and something that i didn't realize until i got a little bit older was that that implied that i understood more of more of the world itself and also more of what it needed going to um I went to university at Purdue and had a tremendous experience. I also ended up getting a master's at the University of Notre Dame. The entire time that I was there working working and also doing school in both of those capacities, um, had a great experience, but also was trying to connect the dots for myself and did so by jumping into as many things as I possibly could within my current capacity and just trying things on for size because I realized for myself the best way for, um, the best way for me to really understand what makes me happy fulfilled and excited is to jump in and try a bunch of different things and if, if I don't end up liking something or it doesn't feel like a purpose or a passion then I that's one less thing on the docket so that was kind of my method of operation as I was trying to just massage out what could my professional life look like what could um like what what do I want my life to be how much of a role do I want work quote unquote or my profession to be in my day-to-day life what does that actually look like so my method was just to get super involved throughout that involvement um got really involved in the Miss America organization got really involved on campus. I paid for school myself, so needed to get really crafty in the way that I was not only um, getting curious about what I could potentially do long term, but also how I was paying for school and what that was going to look like. Because I really, I, I really deeply believe in responsible financial decisions, but at the time didn't really know what that meant. So um, as I was doing all that, got involved in a bunch of different things, as I've said like four times before, but um, really leaned into volunteerism and service. And that's where I realized that philanthropy and getting involved in the nonprofit space from a professional and more corporate level was a possibility. And frankly, I hadn't even considered that to be a profession. I thought it was just feel good. I didn't realize there was also a business that was driving the decisions behind those entities. So knowing that and learning that and with that multifaceted nature, got really involved in a bunch of different stuff ended up with a few different internships i think by the time that i graduated i had like 15 or 20 different internships in a few different industries just because i was curious and that curiosity has continued to drive and propel me forward so fast forward worked in corporate philanthropy finished up the masters started traveling full-time didn't really know exactly what i wanted to do but i did know that i wanted it to be impact based and i did know that the experiences thus far were in marketing They were in um, community development, they were in fundraising, they were in design. Um, There was a little bit of an engineering background in there. There was project management, there was business development. I also launched my first company at the age of 22. So there were a lot of different balls that were being juggled. And it took me really taking that time to explore not only the world in an external way, but also myself internally to figure out that I no longer really wanted to work for someone else full time in a traditional capacity and that my avenue to be able to have the freedom of choice and also the freedom 
freedom of um, creating my own schedule and just freedom generally that I wanted was very much more in entrepreneurship. I realized too at the time that, um, and this was all really over the course of about six months, it was just kind of a simmering thought, um, but as I was doing that, I realized that there was a business structure that could not only combine my, my passions and at that point what I believed the world to need, but also do that in a way that was, that was able to, to help other people accomplish their dreams through not only our service providing, but also through the team that we're building. So very long-winded, but also very quick fast forward from then to now, but um, I currently run a group of companies called The Cultivated Group. We are all about growth and social impact all the time. So we have three subsidiaries, one of which is in the nonprofit space, another of which is in the for-profit space, and the third arm is our creative arm, which is a little bit of a lot of things, including a boutique publishing firm. So um, with the non and for-profit clients that we serve through two of our entities, a lot of what we do is connecting the business brain to the servant's heart because at the heart of what we do is impact and long-term impact at that. We, we make sure that the, the health of your company is going to be sustainable for the long-term, whether it's finances or business development or getting SOPs and processes in place. That's kind of where we're at. So again, very long and short-winded at the same time, but that's from here to now. Wow. <laughs> that like, it, it's just so awesome, you know, hearing your story, um, hearing how you like, constantly just like we're okay with change because um that's what it takes to be a business owner and entrepreneur um is the what's the word i'm looking for can't think of the word but your ability to change the flexibility adaptability. yes adaptability oh, okay. <laughs> it's like that. it's like adaptability agility nimbleness like just i i realized a long time ago that if i loosen the reins and pursue things full force but just play magic happens and it's like this crazy unexplainable cool right place right time kind of synergistic opportunity that's created by trusting life and trusting ourselves and trusting the teams that we're building out. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I really hope that a lot of entrepreneurs are listening to that theme because I think uh, especially a lot of young entrepreneurs, we go into something thinking that, you know, all right, I'm, I'm going for my degree in fine arts and I'm going to do this. I, I, I'm, I'm going for this career field, whatever this looks like, and I have to stick to this. And I think so, so many people are afraid to be, you know, wake up one week and, you know, they're artists. And then the a few months from then, now they're a business owner and they're an art consultant, which it might be similar, but it's not the same thing. And they're mm -hmm. afraid to tell people like, yeah, I was doing this last year. However, I made this type transition. And I think they're afraid of people not taking them seriously because uh, they're making so many different transitions and jumps. And I think I always find it weird when, you you know, somebody who's really, really young tells me like, oh, this is what I'm going to do uh, for the rest of my life. It's, it's kind of like, well, are you like, are you sure that this, are you sure this is what you want to do? Like, how many times have you experimented? Like, I feel like a lot of people, if you're only on, you know, if you know you want to be an entrepreneur and you're only on like your second company, it's like, keep trying, you know, because it's like, maybe it's the second company, but maybe it's the fourth or fifth. You never know. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really cool that you had the courage that it takes in order to explore different avenues in life because I feel like that can be a very challenging journey for a lot of people. Yeah, thank, thanks. And I think too, it speaks a lot to self-confidence and just the ability to like stand behind the decisions that you make despite other people's insecurities or triggers or um, despite their own belief systems coming coming out. I mean, I, I certainly couldn't say, couldn't have said a few years ago that I had the confidence to do now what I'm doing, especially to stand behind it and do so publicly. But I think that's a part of the natural extension of growth that happens when you choose the road less traveled or when you, when you choose to follow your purpose and you choose to lean into the gifts that you've been given and also those that you've cultivated over the course of your life to be able to really activate whatever life it is that you're building and dreaming of. Absolutely. Yep. Um, so another kind of theme that I'm picking up on is the curiosity, uh, because you had to have the curiosity to continue to uh, try different things um, and to even think about trying them, really. So my question to you is, was that curiosity natural? Like, were you just naturally curious all your life or did you have to develop it? 
I think it's been a little bit of both. I think I've always just had this kind of innate, natural, natural, kind of insatiable <laughs> curiosity that's driven a lot of things and a lot of decisions in my life. And the more that I follow that curiosity, the stronger it gets. And not only that, but the stronger my um, my ability to trust myself and the little intuitive hits that I'll get or, um, or my ability to make decisions and discern what is right and wrong at the moment for me and for the direction that now our companies are going. Um, I think that natural, and I think it's kind of like with anything, we all have natural gifts, we all have natural talents, abilities, things that we're more drawn to, but we can lean into those and strengthen them as we continue to grow. So I think it's a little bit of both. Yeah, that's, that's great. And I can definitely agree that um, on the developing side of it, because for me, um, honestly, I don't think I was that curious, like, and until fairly recently like I had to try really hard to develop curiosity especially um, in the business world because it was new for me Um, and I I am finding that the more I lean into it the stronger it gets and I don't have to try as hard and I I feel like you can tell a curious person by how much people's eyes are sparkling (laughs) I know you know when I know you know what I'm talking about like there's like this like, oh, I'm just curious. And there's like a little glimmer. And it's like a glimmer of like this, and the way that I see it, it's like this glimmer of the stretch of what they perceive to be possible for themselves in the world. Like, I'm just gonna push the envelope a little bit. And I'm curious with you, what do you think, what do you think drove that curiosity? Or what do you think was like holding you back from being more curious, even though you wanted to be? And then like, what do you think really shifted that for you? Cause that's really like to lean into that especially as you're developing and growing can feel really scary if that's not your natural state or your natural kind of habit that you're in. Yeah. Uh, Really, I'm going to say that he influenced it a lot. Um, And I tend to do a lot of things out of uh, competition because I'm like super duper competitive. (laughs) So like I saw how curious he was and how far it was getting him and how fast he was learning. And I was like, I need to be like that. I need to, see, I need to beat them. Like, and maybe if I don't beat them, I at least need to get there. If people are going to take me serious in business, uh, so I kind of realized that I needed to be uh, to succeed professionally um, in the way that I want to, like where I want to be. Um, I know that curiosity is something that I will have to have and I will have to cultivate. Um, and continue to develop because really his curiosity, like we wouldn't even have the podcast right now if it wasn't for his curiosity. Uh, We wouldn't really have any of our companies, really. We'd probably just be at like a little regular job. I'd probably be working nine to five at, you know, somebody else's place of business. Um, So his curiosity just stretched us so far and it, it helped develop mine. And then he also pushed me too and telling me that I needed to figure it out. (laughs) How did you go about like when you were first taking the steps and like learning how to walk along that path of curiosity, what helped you? Not necessarily the encouragement, but like, what did you do? Um, well, at the time we were in a mastermind, um, that was like at the start of our business journey. So um, everybody in the mastermind, I noticed that they were curious, so they would ask more questions. So I started trying to like make myself figure out a question to ask, or at least if I'm not going to ask it out loud, kind of just to ask myself. So like I, I would write down, I tried to like do this thing where once a week I studied like a different person in business and, um, that kind of increased curiosity. Uh, I started reading a lot more. Um, The more I read, the more I was like, wow, I want to learn more about this. And I mean, even right now, I've been um, I've been diving deeper into my relationship with God. So I've been doing Bible study for like the past three months, like every single morning. And the more I do it, the more I'm like, all right, this is the question I have. I need to figure out the answer. So really it just comes down to me probably having to figure out what question to ask. And then that kind of just led down this little rabbit hole. I love that. I wonder if that all your like competitive nature comes into play with that. And you, you were like, you figure out the question, but then you get so driven to find the answer that that's what drives the curiosity really. And so you're like, just leveraging your assets. (laughs) 
That can definitely, definitely be. <laughs> so then this leads us into the book. Uh, the What is it called? Esme the Curious Cat? Yes. Yep. Okay. So tell us more about the book and uh, what kind of drove this? Because we, we see that you're very curious. So I would assume that you're kind of like Esme. <laughs> Kind of. The way that I like to talk about it is that it's true, but fiction. Or fiction, but true. <laughs> Either way. Either way you want to coin it. Um, but as I was traveling, I kept everything off of social. I very much wanted a soul experience. And I wanted to learn. I just wanted to learn more. You know, I wanted, being from Indiana, um, it's, a, it's an incredible place to be. And I think there are a lot of stereotypes that are true and a lot that are not. And I think that is very true also about a lot of different places, not only within the U.S., but about the world. And I was really curious, not only about the world, but really about who lives here. <laughs> like, and we have, we have so many people in the world who are pitted against each other for so many different reasons, many of which I still do not understand fully, but I, I certainly can empathize more with. So as I was traveling, some really incredible experiences happened, not only with the people that I met along the way, but also um, just like cultural development and development of cultural competency and understanding and trying new foods and um, seeing the beauty and in, in understanding the beauty that lies in the difference and the beauty of diversity. Um, a lot of the a lot of the children's book series is infused with the things that I learned. So while Esme is not me and I am not Esme, a lot of the adventures that she goes on are very much inspired by the experiences that I have had and also the world that we wish to see as a company. So um, her first, really the first two books are a lot of character introduction. It talks a lot about, and they talk a lot about her, her personality and who she is and set the stage for the different pieces of clothing or different pieces of culture or different recipes or it, there are different nods to different things that will continue to develop along the way as we continue to launch and build the brand. But really um, the goal is to, to add more of an emotional social development perspective to the classroom, but also infuse it with life lessons. And there, I think you all probably had similar um, we all grew up with similar children's books that were like the classics. Mm -hmm. And there have been some really incredible recent developments in the children's space that have spoken to those, but I think the time is really ripe for a new mainstream children's book character that's speaking to a lot of the social issues that are happening right now, highlighting both sides of the story, but really giving people a voice who otherwise haven't been heard. And that's something that we're really aiming to do with this. So, um, yeah, it came about, honestly, I never would have, and I've published these under a pen name. so. At the end of the day, although I have authored them, they're not about me. And I very much know that. And especially on the front end of this kind of just letting people know about what we're doing. I know that she needs a human advocate. So I'm happy to be her. You know, I'm happy to be that. But I'm really excited for when the brand gets to a point that I no longer need to be on podcasts. You know, that I no longer need to be planting the seeds because she speaks for herself and people want to listen and be engaged. So, um, I'm very excited for that myself, and I'm really excited to see where it goes with this, but I certainly would have never expected myself, even five, ten years ago, I mean, I never would have expected myself to be writing and publishing children's books, I never would have expected myself to be in the, um, just to be in the position that I am as a business owner, and one who not only is, I don't know, it just, it blows my mind sometimes when I zoom out. I was really excited because we, from the get-go, we've always been an international company. Not only are our clients internationally distributed, but also our um, team is, which is just, again, speaks to the inclusive and also multidimensional nature of who we are and what we do. But now we're, we're even working on projects that are in space. So like, I think, and I never, ever, ever would have thought that this was possible. And this is a little bit of a tangent from the book thing, but I, I think there's a really amazing opportunity in the midst of the the year that we're having right now um, to lean into reimagining what we believe to be possible for ourselves. And that's something that we're hoping to do with this children's book series. So again, it was inspired by a lot of the adventures that I've had throughout my own life, but also planting seeds for a greater future because that's what we're about. Yeah, that is awesome. Because, you know, kids are the future like <laughs> you know that that's not arguable um and we have to do better for them so that they could do better because you know 2020 we see that we're very flawed <laughs> and we have a lot of work to do but 
planting those seeds now rather than, you know, waiting until the time is right or, you know, whatever people's excuses are is like phenomenal. Thank you. And yeah, it's, it's certainly been one of the most creatively fulfilling, but also terrifying experiences I've ever, I've ever done because, um, I think sometimes it can be really scary and I, I totally understand people who are full of excuses. Like I get it. I've been there. I think we all have. And I think, too, this is a really beautiful time to really look at, okay, what is actually holding us back from pursuing the things that we want to be pursuing? What's holding you back from writing the book that you want to write? What's holding you back from starting the company or consulting or coaching or side gig or not even that? What's holding you back from having the family that you want to have or being the partner you want to be or anything like that? I think we're being given this really beautiful opportunity of time, particularly this year, not necessarily to slow down, but to lean into the hard stuff because we're not allowed to go anywhere. And since that's the case, maybe we should just sit here and work on the hard stuff. Yeah, right. <laughs> Might as well. Yeah. Can't hurt. One thing I was really curious about is, um, so the name of the book is Esme the Curious Cat. So did you make it a cat on purse on purpose did you make her a cat on purpose because like i always hear this um this like, saying of like oh curiosity kills the cat and then i look at my own journey and i'm like well anytime i made a mistake it's because i didn't really ask the right questions so if anything lack of curiosity <laughs> killed the cat because i could tell you so many mistakes i've made in business where like literally one question would have totally alleviated that problem but it ended up being a bigger problem because i didn't ask a question so i don't subscribe to that belief of curiosity kills uh the cat so i was wondering if, is that the reason why you uh, made that character a, a cat to kind of change that narrative. In our you know, society. that wasn't the original reason, but that ended up being a peripheral, like fuel to the argument, if you want to call it that. So somebody asked me that actually in the interview, they were like, so did curiosity that killed the cat? Or they basically like positioned it in the same way that you did. And I was like, well, did it? I mean, <laughs> I don't know that we ever got the answer to that. And yeah, cats have nine lives or what, however you want to call it. But in my own life, as long as the decision and the curiosity that is driving the decisions that I'm making is coming from a place that is rooted in truth or coming from a place that is rooted in goodness. And um, like, obviously, in, like use common sense, right? But I've never, my curiosity has never led me astray. It's, it hasn't necessarily been like directly from point A to point Z, but it has given me, that curiosity has helped me to learn the lessons that I've needed to learn in order to get from point A to point D, yeah, which would yeah. have been a lot, I don't know. I um, So no, that originally wasn't the purpose that she did. She was a cat. We actually wanted to keep her very culturally ambiguous and we wanted to keep her um, just kind of neutral. I mean, she's she's super cute she has glasses she's very much a cat but she's also very much a kid and um we wanted to make sure that she would translate amongst different cultures yeah and initially cats and dogs but it just kind of i don't even know how how the idea came and the way that i view it, ideas is that they come to visit i don't view them as mine so i think a part of the reason why um I view this book and these companies as such a, a huge privilege is because I feel like I am the nurturer of them and the steward of them, but I don't feel like they are mine because they're not. I might own them and I might have the honor of looking after them and growing them, but they are not mine. These companies are not a part of my identity. And I think that's a really, not only interesting, but also a really important distinction to make as you have a business owner or as, as you are a business owner and have a business. Yeah. I really agree with that um, <clears throat> because Joe and I, like, we always talk a lot about um, how men get their identity, like, through their work. And that caused a lot of uh, suicides in men. Like, if they lose their job, then, you know, unfortunately, some of them do commit suicide for it. Um, <clears throat> so it's definitely important to make that that distinction. And I like that you just articulated that because it's a good reminder for uh, not only our listeners, but, you know, for us too as well. Uh, so that was very, very profound. <clears throat> Thanks. I mean, I think it's the same thing with women and, and different roles that we play, not only within our own family units or society or, or wherever specifically, but I think we all know 
motherhood, I think, is a beautiful example. I mean, I'm not a mother, so I, I cannot speak to that kind of an experience from my own. But I do know a lot of women who are my age who are mothers and who have disassociated their sense of self from who they were and completely kind of engulfed this sense of motherhood and this, the identity that is that as a piece of themselves very much in a similar way that men do the same thing with the work piece of their identity. And I just think it's really important to have a pulse on as not only we are fulfilling these roles, but as we are planting seeds for the future and creating the lives of our dreams through what we choose to involve and not involve in our lives. I just think it's an important part of the conversation to have. So a part of um, the whole curiosity, like, and not missing opportunities, um, how do you, like, was that kind of the reason that you just decided to Um, have all of these companies at once and you know if so like how are you like just talk to us more about having you know multiple projects going on how does that how does that feel how is that so I wouldn't recommend it for everybody (laughs) (laughs) yeah I think um and you guys will understand this too it's a lot and especially if you have a tight restrictive sense of ownership over every single piece of what you are working on and I'm preaching to myself here too because some like some days I'll be very very fluid and trusting and some days I'll be very tight about the way that I am and and we and our team is um, moving forward and I think whatever faith you subscribe to having faith and having trust that you will be guided um, along certain certain turns of your path or certain decisions that you need to make or if you are in in the business of of making life better for people you'll be guided to the best solution as you continue to pursue those curiosities and as you continue to honor the opportunities that you have i think leaning into that has been crazy transformational for me and for our companies because it is a lot for one or two people to handle and especially um I mean, one company is is enough, you know, but to have three or four, looking back, I'm really, really grateful and really glad that we did it the way that we did. But also at the same time, that wasn't the only thing happening in my life. So my dad at that point was diagnosed with a terminal cancer and I had just pivoted out of um, traveling full time to come back to Indiana and be home with him. So I not only was launching these companies and breathing life into that and learning what it meant to be an author and a publisher and all of these different things, just wearing a lot of different hats and a ton of different accessories at the same time, but really leaning into also figuring out what, what I wanted my relationship with my identity to be as a daughter and what being a good daughter and being a good caretaker meant to me and how I was able to express and honor that through action at that time in my life. Um, so I say all of these things because it's things are never what they seem, but which we all know. But I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing that for everybody at the same time unless you know it's the right thing for you. And if you have the self awareness to know that and to know that you are, to know that that is the right decision for you, Godspeed. Because um, I too believe that life prepares us for things through the through the decisions that we make and through the yeses and nos that we make within the opportunities that are presented to us. And I know that at that point, I was making some really tough, big decisions that at the time I didn't realize the full impact of. And they've prepared me to make really tough calls, not only throughout this year, but also for the tr- for the rest of the trajectory of these businesses, which are just getting started. So as far as like a project management or like a like day-to-day how do we keep the needle moving forward and not feel like a total failure all the time or like not feel like we're totally drowning all the time? Um, it can feel like a daily battle sometimes because overwhelm is real. And especially as we're going through the turbulence that is this year, it is, I mean, there are so many things that we're trying to juggle on top of everything that we already anticipated for the year. And some of those are really beautiful things, but a lot of them are a lot deeper and they need more, more emotional space to process than I think a lot of us are used to giving. So, for us, it's all about kind of redirecting to the North Star. If one really quick and easy tool that we use on our team is in or out. If it's in, it stays. If it's out, it doesn't stay. And that's in relation to whatever goal, mission, vision, values, project, service, whatever we're providing to check the box or to make sure the client is happy or um, to get the book published or whatever. If it is not necessary and doesn't move the needle for us, 
it leaves the brain space because our team is very small and very nimble and very agile and we don't have time or energy to be just spinning the wheels on things that aren't actually aren't actually enhancing the operation that we're building. So in using that, that's been a really, um, and literally in or out, boom, done. You know, it's, it's very, very quick, but very, very effective. Um, it also helps to cultivate trust in your own decision-making abilities, which that and confidence coupled together just makes for a much more tight team. And also um, that, tra- I mean, that translates. So everything that we do is rooted in the North Star um, but I mean, sometimes that's really hard. Yeah. yeah. You know, and and like, I don't. I also think we don't talk enough about not necessarily like mental disease within the entrepreneurial community, but there aren't a lot of spaces that people can go to talk about the overwhelm from yeah. a solution-oriented perspective. And um, yeah, I also think that's a really important conversation to be having because if you're one or two people starting one or six businesses. You can automate all you want, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you won't be pulled and stretched in different directions that you are used to and that you don't you need community. So I, for us, it's been a really important time to lean into community and that's something that we've really clung to. But yeah, it's a lot, especially starting companies is a lot, but it has been easily the most professionally fulfilling and also stretching from both root and wing perspective that I have ever experienced in my life. And I'm really grateful for it. That's awesome. That is awesome. So then with um, all of the different companies, uh, we talked about this a little bit before we started recording as far as like, you know, everyone understanding like what you do and all the different types of things that you do. Can we continue that conversation? Because you mentioned that you don't think everyone has to know. And I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, I think, um, so one thing that I explore a lot is the value of specialization. So being super multi-passionate myself and also having a team who is incredibly multi-passionate, very multi-talented, there are some things that we particularly specialize in, but a lot of things we play with. And this is from a service perspective, but also just from, again, following that curiosity perspective, we're constantly learning, constantly innovating, constantly growing, rooted in those core values in that North Star that we are pursuing at the end of the day. So I've gotten a few different questions, especially recently about, so what do you what do you think about specialization? And what do you think about being in one, in, like, one specific industry, like being known as X? And I think there's certainly a case for it, but I, I don't think the runway and the foundation is where you end. I think that's where you take off from. And I don't know that specializing in one thing for your entire career is the way that I want to go, but I do certainly see a case for it because 20 years of experience in a said industry will absolutely potentially make you an expert if you maintain the momentum and velocity that you would if you were a beginner in said industry too. So yeah, with that, I don't know that positioning yourself as X or positioning your company as a certain one thing is always that much of an asset because what if you want to pivot? It's not necessarily about shifting the entire narrative, but I realized really early on that my parents are not necessarily in my target demographic. So if I have maybe a one sentence thing that is vague enough and understanding enough that they'll have anchor pieces that they can understand within the context of themselves, that's enough. They don't need to understand the ins and outs of every single thing that I'm doing within every single context of every single project of every single business. They don't necessarily need to understand that. Neither does all of the audience that we have. Yeah. I, I felt a lot and our team felt a lot of pressure for a long time to, yes, absolutely effectively articulate what we do and who we are, but we don't need to do it in the same way that everybody else is doing it because we're not doing business in the same way that everybody else is doing it. Mm-hmm. And once we realized that, the pressure kind of fell away because it became more important for us to stick to our mission and vision and values and drive forward with the way that we are choosing to run the marathon versus the way that somebody else is choosing to do it. Absolutely. And I totally agree with that too, because I felt this tremendous pressure when I was first starting out as a business owner to super good at one thing, become the best in the world at one thing, master it and become known for that. But I think, you know, I think there's a little bit of artist in every single business owner, whether they're in the nonprofit sector or sector or the for-profit sector. I believe that that artist inside of each business owner uh, wants 
to be creative, wants to think outside of the box, wants to uh, venture into other industries, sell other products that are not traditionally something that somebody in their sector would sell or different services. And I think a lot of people, I think business is an art and a science. And I think a lot of people focus so much on a science and they never really, I don't think you can master the art, but they never really explore that part. And I think that's such a huge part of business business ownership and entrepreneurship that a lot of people, uh, they just never explore it because we have this myth that people need to work in the same industry for 40 plus years and get good at that. And I interviewed this guy named uh, Damien Lupo, and he said something that was super profound. I'll never forget it. He said, some people don't really have 20 years of experience. They have one year of experience that they repeated 20 times. And I was like, that is crazy because I've met people like that, where it's like they've been doing this for 20 years, but it's almost like they hit this ceiling in their career where um, there's not much more to learn and they would get so much more growth if they crossed over into something else and tried to learn about that. So that's why even though when we're presenting ourselves to the public, we'll tell them here's what we're best at in our organization. However, if you see us doing this over here or this over there, just know that that's also part of our journey as well. And we'll tell you what we're really good at and what we're just kind of playing with. And we'll be happy to serve you in both realms. But we don't feel the need to tell people like, oh, this is our industry. This is our lane. We're only going to ever stay here. And I think that's also important from a longevity standpoint, too, because from my experience and just from what I've seen in the world, companies that for whatever reason, and can't pivot or innovate with the times, eventually they, you know, go out of business. Like everybody talks about Blockbuster. Blockbuster still would have been here if they just would have bought Netflix for a couple million dollars. And they probably had that sitting in like some, you know, they probably had that in the office at the right. moment, <laughs> you know, because they were a giant back then. And all they had to do is either say, hey, we'll buy it or B, let's like find a way to partner together. They would still be here they, and they were still be like a really household name. But it's that, um, you know, that almost um, that rootedness into whatever you're doing and you think that, you know, there there won't be something that come along and change the direction or uh, uproot what you've already created. And if you can create more roots by trying different things, when it comes time to pivot, you've already been pivoting the whole time as opposed to it being something new to you and then you do it too slowly and then your company suffers for it. So I think you, you speak to something that I believe in and I feel like it's a very underrated idea. But I think uh, if we continue to tell our truths more people will come to understand like you know it's okay if you're like an executive at this uh journal you know uh journalism company and you also sell baseball cards like if that's what you're into do both like yeah. if, if you, magician, have the you know do like i think a lot of times we hold ourselves back from the things that true the, the things that we're curious about that have the potential to truly make us happy because we want to feel and be understood yeah but i think that um that translates into business so well because like I, and I'm just using my parents as an example because I love them so dearly and they are so disattached from what we're currently doing and building. They, they support in the ways that they can and know how, but the world is different than it was 40 years ago. Absolutely. And I would, I would hope so, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that also means that 40 years from now, if we want the businesses that we're currently building to be in existence, we also need to have the ability to pivot and be agile and complete. And in my opinion, that requires us dropping the need to completely be understood because we never were in the first place absolutely and that doesn't mean don't do your best as from a really strategic marketing perspective and and don't try and don't like you know i'm not implying don't write a guest copy like do what you need to do to make your businesses profitable and relevant yeah. and also speak your truth but don't hold back at the expense of feeling the need to be understood as a business owner or feeling the need to be understood within whatever subset or sector you might you might feel pigeonholed in right now because of the way that you've messaged so far because again that starting point is not where you intend to end it's all about reverse engineering that solution reverse engineering that end point and making actionable steps for yourself to be able to to bridge the gap absolutely totally agree yeah 
So this was such an awesome episode. And we talked like we really did talk about so much. So <laughs> what is the number one takeaway that you want someone to walk away from this episode with? At the end of the day, um, it's going to be a big cliche. So <laughs> I'm just preparing you That's for that. Right. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it is we are so much more capable than we realized. And we've already been given everything that we need in order to be able to fulfill our life's passion and mission. And the only thing that holds us back from doing that is ourselves. So anybody who's listening and to you guys, and even to myself, I'm I'm saying this because I need to hear it too, but the only thing holding ourselves back is ourselves and the belief systems that we're lugging around that might not necessarily be ours or the hurt that we've packed away and haven't unpacked since 20 years ago. You know, I mean, there are so many incredible opportunities that are within our reach that all we need to do is take the blinders off so that we can be able to not only see them but really engage with them and i would encourage you if you're curious at all lean into the personal and professional development that could get you to the next level because that's the foundation and the bedrock from which all of the decisions that we're talking about having the capacity to make that's the bedrock from which those those things stem And that's how roots are planted and that's how trees grow and that's how you're able to have wings and simultaneously have roots. So um, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm really excited and really curious to see what kind of seeds we're even planting right now because I know that the work that we're all trying to do and we're all actively doing is really just one day at a time. You know, it's all about the consistency of the day to day, sowing the seeds. And um, yeah, I just, I really appreciate you guys opening up your space to me and your community to me. And I'm really grateful to be here. Thank, Thank you, you so much. So you're on the Abundant Culture podcast and we feel the need to ask this question to everybody who comes on because we always get very unique and interesting answers. And the question is, whether it's in your personal life, business life, spirituality, whatever you want to say, how do you spread abundance to the people around you? I think it's through presence. Yeah, I've realized for myself, especially doing as many things as we're doing, and I'm sure you guys can relate to this too, it's really easy to be in forecasting mode and in problem solving mode rather than present engagement mode. And I've realized that the biggest gift that I can give people is the intentionality and kindness and generosity that is me as my full self in whatever interaction I'm in at that time. And that's it. Um, And I don't necessarily believe that presence is the one overall and I'll be all piece of abundance, but I do believe it's a key ingredient. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I agree. And it's funny how that seems like it should be the simplest thing, but it's really (laughs) hard, especially for business owners. And I've struggled with it in the past as well. And it's like, wow, it's like, literally, you just need to sit there and shut up sometimes. And it's like, you can't, you can't do it. (laughs) And just listen. And not only listen to yourself, but like listen to other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or, Or just, I don't know. Yeah, I think it is incredibly, it interests me to no end how easy it is for us to be distracted and constantly yeah. stimulated and how difficult it can feel to to just be. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So if somebody wants to work with either uh, you or your team, how would they get into contact with you all? Sure, we would love to hear from anybody who is curious. <laughs> but our, the best way to get in touch with us is either social or through our websites. So for Esme the Curious Cat, if you want to buy the books, they're available at Amazon, Barnes Noble, Walmart, um, independent bookstores, also via our website, which is EsmeTheCuriousCat.com. Our social links are just at Esme the Curious Cat on Facebook and Instagram. The Cultivated Group's website is TheCultivatedGroup.co. We do have a couple slots left open for the rest of 20. 20, if anybody's curious about business building or connecting heart to brain from a business perspective and what that looks like. Um, and also our, our social is at The Cultivated Group on both Facebook and Instagram. Awesome. awesome. Well, thank you again, Emily, uh, so, so much for this wonderful conversation. I think this was like one of the best conversations that I've had on the podcast, um, going like back and forth anyway, um, because a lot of times it's more so just like an interview, but this was very conversational. And I, I mean, that's the reason we have this podcast is to keep it conversational. So we really enjoyed it. I love it. Well, thank you guys again so much for having me. It's great to meet you both. I hope you have a beautiful, beautiful rest of the day and rest of the week. 
Thank you. you. Too. So that's all we have for today, folks. I hope you got as much value out of this as we did. Keep in mind, the only way we can improve is through constructive feedback. So remember to rate and review this episode. Also, you are not the only person that needs to know this super valuable information. So be sure to subscribe and share as well. Stay tuned for the next episode. And remember to always spread abundance. Peace.